Okay, so this is the third installment and the final episode of JMSC's uh, fake news series. And because this is the final episode, I want to do something a bit different. Uh, in the poster, the blurb said, this is going to be a semi-workshop style discussion seminar. So I want to start with a little conversation. I want to ask you what fake news is. In other words, what is fake news in the first place? And why do you think it's a problem? Right? I know we don't have much time. So if you could pair up with the person sitting next to you, I'll give you a few minutes. If you could define what the fake news is and why it is a problem uh, in three minutes, that'd be great. All right, start. <laughs> Right. All right, I guess that's three minutes. <laughs> so, what is fake news? Anybody wants to define fake news for the audience? <laughs> All right, yes. Okay, so anything that is made up is fake news? Okay, so it's a news story, but inside there are lots of made up facts. That's fake news for you. All right? Yes? Yeah. That's like deliberately produced to manipulate people or mislead people. Okay, so it's produced with the intention that we're going to deceive people or trick people. That's fake news. All right, who else? Yes? It, news is uh, it's not opinion. Okay. It's uh, something really happened. Okay. Okay. And that's why we take it as a fact. Right. But a fact to be a fact. But right. But a fake, then it's uh -huh. not a fact. That's very important. Okay, so fake news is news stories that include non-factual information? Yes. It's okay. not a story or not anything. Okay. What about the news that has opinions then, in your view? Then opinion. Then someone say it is opinion, that right. is a fact too. Okay. 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 So opinion's fine. But someone has given something, it's a fact. Okay. Right now, no more, no more opinion. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Great. Uh, who else? So when you say Donald Trump says CNN is fake news, New York Times is fake news, what would be your reaction then? Is his definition wrong? No. Nope. Okay, who said no? <laughs> Somebody immediately said no. All right, it's you, right? Yeah. Uh, if Donald Trump says that CNN, CNN produces fake news, it's his opinion that it, it is a fake news. It doesn't. Yes, yes. <laughs> oh, so what's your definition of fake news? Media yeah. practitioners. Okay, so media pr practitioners produce something that contains non factual information. That's fake news. Okay, you wanted to say something? Yeah. No, I, I don't know what Donald Trump thinks, but it's clear yeah. that his definition of fake news yeah. is news which does not report uh, things related to him in a way that he would like. Right. So he used the word fake news to say that I don't like this news coverage. All right. Uh, anybody else wants to say what fake news is? If the definition is that simple, probably we won't be having this workshop right now. Right? What are the issues? What is the problem? By the way, that's my daughter right there. <laughs> and I asked her, can you go like this? Because I want to use it for Photoshop, I mean, no, PowerPoint. And she's like, this is fake, daddy. Nobody does this. <laughs> so that was also a fake way of. <laughs> but anyway, so what's the problem then? It seems we all agree that the fake news is something made up in news stories, and we disapprove that. Then what's the problem? Yes? Well, the more fake news is generated, the harder it is for people to distinguish fake news from. OK. News. All right, so that's one good point, right? 
We know that made up facts is not good in news stories, but it's really hard to actually tell which fact is made up and which fact is actually verified by reporters. So it's really difficult for people to identify which is fake and which is not. What else? Is that the only problem we're having? Yes, some. So the term fake news <laughs> yeah. is starting to encompass a lot of different types of misinformation. So right. The point that we don't actually know what fake news is. Right, exactly. Uh, by the way, she's hard. She's my PhD student, so she should know <laughs> all of these. Yes? Since more and more yeah. people are consuming uh, their uh, news uh, consumption on social media platforms, right. it will be harder to, uh, since fake news are more right. than those yes. platforms. So. Okay, fantastic. So even the definition of news is changing, right? Any information you get on your Facebook feed, social media feed, many people consider that news. And if the definition of news encompasses all sorts of information that you consume every day, it's really difficult to find out what is genuine news report and what is actually made up. Especially when sophisticated you know, individuals or groups with lots of money try to produce something that would look genuine news stories and yet it's not really news. Uh, there are many efforts done by people in our field. So one is, uh, this one is a European organization. They define 10 different types of misinformation. So it's, they say beyond fake news. So basically they try to sort of classify different types of misleading information. Uh, first draft news, it's on the right. They also do that. They have seven types instead of 10. They sort of map this to say, this particular type of misleading information is intended to be used in this way, and what sort of people will use, um, et cetera, et cetera. So there are efforts in our field right now to sort of categorize different types of misinformation and identify the characteristics of each so that we can sort of you know, educate uh, news audience what sort of things they should be looking for. Uh, looking for. Um, so this one is uh, created by myself. So in my definition, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I used to use this slide before everybody started talking about fake news, so I might need to update. But in essence, I think these are the types of misinformation we encounter every day. So it's not just bogus news or propaganda that is all made up, right? Sometimes people pick all the facts, but connect unrelated dots and create a story that's often considered like conspiracy theories or half truth. It's based on facts, but it's one side of the story. And it's not really the whole picture. And that can be completely misleading as well. Um, sometimes journalists interview people. And people who are being interviewed, they lie to reporters. So it's not journalists' intention to include misinformation. But if everybody I spoke to, if I'm a reporter, tells me lie, and if I quote them, essentially I am disseminating misinformation because I was lied to and I didn't double check. And this happens quite often, right? Uh, sometimes people think satire and commentaries, opinion pieces, are news stories because some opinion news is, you know, pieces are really hard to distinguish from news as well. So there are many different types. Native advertisement is another one. So these are the types of misinformation that we encounter every day. So there are a lot of different kinds. Now, any questions so far? <laughs> right. So we kind of agree that, well, misleading information can be problematic, right? So now my son. <laughs> yeah. So he asks, what can we do? Right? And there are two ways to solve this problem. At least in our industry, we are trying to tackle fake news problems right now. And probably I would say, OK, let's divide it. On this side, you think about supply side solution. In other words, what could news media do? What could journalists do to solve these issues? Misinformation, people believing in something that is not true, right? So on this side of the room, you come up with demand side solution. What can news audience do? What should we do to avoid you know, being tricked, right? So again, another three minutes, time's running. So, so three minutes, 
find solutions on demand side, find solutions on supply side, uh, supply side, demand side. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So you found the solutions. <laughs> okay. Seems supply side has more discussions. <laughs> All right, thirty more seconds. Uh. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay, so let's discuss this together. I know three minutes is not enough. <laughs> Obviously, if we can solve this in three minutes, we again, we won't be here, but all right. Well, let's start from supply side then. This side was a bit more lively in terms of <laughs> discussions. What can we do? Uh, yes. So we were discussing um, a way that news media organizations could sign up to an independent uh, standard which is set and they're audited uh, to see whether they uh, okay why would that stand and if so they get a sort of like a, a you know a quality standard mark right being sort of right journalistic standards which we've come historically to okay uh, take for granted. okay all right so something like international fact checking uh, what's it called IFCN international fact checking network is actually doing Right, so if you become a IFCN signatory at the moment, you get that little tick, and Google will recognize that. So when you publish um, news stories, you have a little template given by Google, and say, here is the claim made by politician, here's what we fact-checked. That kind of information is actually recognized by Google, and it, uh, it shows in the search results in the US market. So you think that kind of effort would help, certainly. I mean, at least it's happening already. Right, uh, what else? That's a great idea, by the way, yeah. Yes? There needs to be light shown and exposure made of fake news creators. We need to expose the, how fake uh, news so, is created. Okay, okay, legit news organizations expose fake <laughs> news organizations and report about them. Okay, all right. So in other words, let people know what sort of sites are considered fake news sites. All right, what else? Yes. Uh, stop the stop the, the, the news anchor. Yeah. I don't know if you decided to talk about something you don't okay. know. Okay. All right. So how about separate the news network yep. to some gossip network and they uh -huh. can say whatever, but uh -huh. news network has to be responsible for what they say. Okay. So they have to change the way they tell news as well. Yeah, because they need hit rate. They need uh -huh. to make money. Okay. But in order to get it popular, they have to totally separate. This is gossip. This right. is news. This is right. Because people are gossip, but they have to know what is right, what is wrong. And okay. All right. Okay. So I think that's what the next step, right? So even genuine news organizations, they have entertainment news, they have opinion pieces, they have uh, different kinds of stories, and they should sort of separate that. Another thing is probably he said, she said journalism. This expert said this. That expert said that. Now you decide. That's kind of irresponsible because. Then what, what's the truth? You know, who's lying and who's telling the truth? It's really hard for the audience to figure out in that kind of he said, she said journalism. So in other words, supply side has to improve what they do, and we should recognize that. All right, any other things to add? Educate yes? Sure Educate the journalists. Educate the journalists. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Right. Okay, so standard of journalism has yes. to be raised they in many countries. Opinion okay, uh, all right, all right. That concerns a major issue of freedom of speech, right? If you think about it, if somebody says, this news organization's trustworthy, we give you a, a logo, then who decides that? 
government and is in that censorship, right? If you say, no, no, industry associations decide, it's the model Japan has, right, with the press club, and it's notorious because they exclude everybody else. If you have member of these organizations, yes, you are considered great, but all the other alternative media are excluded from press conferences and meetings with the prime ministers, it is a huge problem. So supply side solution, yes, the effort is going on, but there are limitations too, and there are big concerns about free speech and whatnot. All right, so demand side, what's the solution? I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay. Like okay. Come to workshops like this. <laughs> All right. So, just as journalists need more training, you think audience also needs more training. Then look for different news sources. Attend workshops like this. <laughs> what else? Well, maybe yep. taking the supply and demand side yep. analogy a little too literally, but uh -huh. basically just voting with your dollars in uh -huh. terms of. Subscribing to news organizations right. that, right. that are doing legitimate work. Right. Because, you know, they, they're pretty, like, the financial situation for a lot of those organizations have been hurt lately. Right. So it seems more important now than ever to help support right. the avenues that you do read, right. just rather than just going on. Right. Free. Exactly. Exactly. That's what we want to achieve in our news literacy education. So basically, if supply side has a problem and January news stories cannot make money, and they resort to clickbait headlines, for example, then demand side can change that, right? Demand pay for quality journalism. And that's something that we also think about quite a lot. And the problem of supply side, I, mean, I want to discuss more, but <laughs> time, we don't have that much. So uh, Facebook started flagging disputed content. Right, so again, this one is currently at the moment in US market and also some selected European market. It doesn't appear in Hong Kong. But some news stories that are disputed, in other words, some other news organizations say this contains false information, Facebook will flag that. So if you want to share, for example, a questionable news story on Facebook and you press you know, share, it says this content is disputed. Associated Press says this and this and this claim is not really true. Do you really want to share? And you say, yes. Are you really sure? Have you really visited <laughs> fact-checking website? You say, yes. So there are two or three steps before you uh, share disputed content. right? However, uh, two professors from Yale University did a study to see if that's effective or not. Their conclusion at the moment is uh, it doesn't that work that well. And also, Guardian had a report saying the same thing, basically. Right? So at least two independent uh, research looked at it and concluded that at the moment it's not that effective. And the Yale University professors actually said it could com be counterproductive. When you say it's disputed, it sounds like there might be a truth in there. It could be that major fact checkers are wrong because it's disputed, right? So nobody knows what the truth is at this moment. So the language also is probably problematic at this stage. And also, I had one two, uh, two minute video from Vox, and we cannot get the sound, but I'll try to play and see if you can hear. Uh, let's see. Donald Trump has made roughly 500 false statements in his first 200 days in office. That's about 2.5 falsehoods per day. He's urging his outlets to full time back then.
Yeah, go away. Right, I stop here. The actual video is much longer than this. If you're interested, you can you know, take a photo of this and <laughs> visit our YouTube website. Um, so fact checking doesn't seem to change people's mind. I think it's important and respectable what they are doing, right, to correct the mistakes that are spreading around uh, our you know, people in the public, but it seems it's less effective. And it's because obviously <laughs> humans are all, how do you say, well, we are all humans, right? So cognitive dissonance is big. Basically, when we encounter conflicting cognition, it could be ideas, beliefs, we sort of you know, tend to uh, skew that particular information. Um, that story, uh, this illustration on the right, is a uh, fox and a sour grape. Uh, it's an Aesop folktale, if I remember. Does anybody know the story? Well, what's the story? Uh, she wants to eat and tell right. somebody else is sour. Right. Yeah, uh, so a fox wants to eat the grapes, but he cannot reach it or she cannot reach it. So she decided, nah, grape is sour. It's not worth my effort. So in other words, brain says he doesn't, she doesn't know whether grape is juicy or not. She's hungry. But as soon as she realized the fact that she cannot reach it, she concluded that it's not worth my effort. Grape is sour. It's sort of like, you know, young men asking, why don't I have girlfriends? Oh, it's them who do not recognize my <laughs> great personality. It's not my fault, it's their fault. <laughs> no, I mean, that's, that's exactly what cognitive dissonance is. Right? Your brain tries to make sense with the limited information you have. And the reasoning could, could be completely illogical. And this happens all the time in our brain. In fact, some researchers, uh, so basically this is the mechanism, right? How it works. When you have conflicting information, you feel anxiety, right? You feel insecure. You get stressed out. To relieve the stress, your brain naturally, right, subconsciously provide, uh, subconsciously avoid that kind of, um, how do you say, uncomfortableness in the brain. So you try to seek harmony rather than truth. And I think those of you who are from Asian culture, you, you can really, you know, th that's our philosophy, right? Harmony. Uh, is more important than truth sometimes, right? Compromise, go in the middle. I mean, that's what Confucius said um, in, the, in the book called, uh, what was the title of the book? Doctrine of the Means, right? Don't go extreme, go to the means, right? Truth lies in there. That might not be true, but that's how our brain is wired, right? Um, so in fact, so this is, the known cognitive dissonance that we experience every day, and there are uh, 133 of them. <laughs> um, there, again, if you, if you want to get a better picture, you can go to uh, designhack.co and type cognitive dissonance, and they list all the known cognitive you know, dissonance by uh, psychologists. Right, right. But they are divided into four bigger categories, right? Uh, too much information. That's exactly what we have on the internet, and that's why our brain has to do something about it, right? Uh, not enough meaning, lots of quick clickbaits, lots of cat videos, right? It's hard to make sense of those things, and yet our brain tried to do, make sense of that kind of things, right? And we need to act fast. In other words, um, right? Um, <coughs> journalists included, we are now living in 24-7 news cycles. Something happens, you immediately want to information. If shooting happens in Las Vegas, one minute later, you want an update, right? Uh, so you go to Facebook, you go to Twitter, you try to get more information, right? Uh, and also, why should we, what should we remember? Uh, memory is another big uh, obstacle for the truth to prevail uh, at the moment. Um, Thing. Next slide. So because of the cognitive dissonance, when you talk about news, these are the things that we see quite often. Selective distortion and retention. In other words, you read news articles. It's, it has maybe 600 words. You only remember certain pieces of information that you agree with, uh, you know, agree with your belief. And then you forget the rest. <laughs> right? So that happens quite often. Uh, so in other words, we selectively remember certain information and forget others. 
And also we do misattribute things all the time. Uh, so for example, you watch CNN program, it's a talk show, there are two people debating and they are expressing their opinion. When you retell that story to your friends, you know, I watched this morning CNN and CNN said this and that. It's not CNN who's saying it, it's actually a guest invited by CNN saying that opinion, but you say, no, that's CNN's opinion because you watch it on CNN, right? Uh, same thing happens quite often, you hear something on Facebook, right? Uh, there was a fire at Hong Kong U. And when you, t you retell that story to your mother, you know, you know I was browsing uh, smartphones during Masato's lecture, it was boring. <laughs> and I saw CMB reporting that Hong Kong U was on fire, right? It wasn't such an morning post, but you misattribute. And this could happen quite often. Uh, confirmation bias is something that probably many of you are already familiar with, right? You try, tend to like and share things that confirms your bias, right? Uh, many people do this, personal experience as an isolate, uh, take personal experience and believe that that's everybody else's experience. Um, that happens quite often. So there are many, uh, again, we probably don't have time to go through each, there are many, you know, <laughs> um, behaviors that we can observe thanks to cognitive dissonance at the moment. Um, and the last one is probably what people who are producing fake news are taking advantage of. Certain topics really trigger emotional reactions. And once you emotionally react in your brain, it's really hard to see log logic anymore. And those topics include politics and race and gender issues and religion. And there are some others that the researchers find out, but these four topics especially, are already identified as those touchy subjects where fake news can prevail because it's an emotional topic, right? Um, any questions so far? So my work is mostly on the demand side, not the supply side. There are many uh, colleagues who are working on fact checking and how to sort of analyze how false information spreads. That was the talk from Kinwa and Ann Kruger, my colleagues, in the previous weeks. Uh, I'm on this side, the demand side. What I do is news literacy education. And what we are trying to achieve is to teach future generation of news consumers how to identify and distinguish quality journalism from bad journalism. Right? So the problem of fake news is that you cannot just say, oh, fake news uh, websites are these, and you have a list of blacklists. And the trustworthy news organizations are like this, and you have a whitelist, right? So whitelist, blacklist approach won't work because sometimes whitelisted news organizations like uh, Shintao, right, talking about how American think tank discovered that Occupy Central movement in Hong Kong was orchestrated by Washington. Or Time Magazine saying that air pollution in Beijing is so bad that the government decided to project sunrise images <laughs> to please the residents. <laughs> right, it's a clickbaity story, but you know, this wasn't true at all. The think tank was actually based in Thailand. They are con conspiracy theorists. The name of the researcher from the think tank land destroyer, this guy doesn't even exist, right? Uh, Thai magazine completely made a mistake, right? <laughs> That sunrise image is actually an ad, a uh, TV ad, right, by tourist board. It had nothing to do with air pollution whatsoever. So it was a genuine mistake by the reporter, but you can say this is fake news in the sense that it doesn't tell, you know, fact-based information. So whitelist, blacklist doesn't work. Our belief in news literacy is that each, every one of us has to be equipped with critical thinking skills so that when we read whatever, it doesn't matter if a story comes from Xinhua News Agency or New York Times or Time Magazine, we try to look at it one by one. And we can sometimes conclude that this Xinhua report is produced really good. This New York Times story has lots of opinions but not many facts. You can say that, right? So in other words, we really look at each piece of information in our curriculum. And that's what we are trying to teach. So this is the definition of what we call news literacy. It's basically an effort to teach 
critical thinking skills so that people have the ability to you know, <laughs> uh, assess the credibility of each piece of information, no matter where it comes from. Um, so when Sao Morning Post says, Chinese Communist Youth League opened Twitter account, and I don't know how many of you have heard of this story. Right? Twitter is not, Twitter is prohibited in mainland China, but uh, Communist Youth League can open Twitter account, blah, 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 right? And many people responded. Probably most of you say SCMP is you know, credible enough, so you read this and that's, you think that's true. However, if you have critical thinking skills to analyze the news article, you realize that reporter didn't really check anything much. Right? So Twitter account was there, many people are commenting, and that's pretty much it. Right? Is it really true or not? Three days later, the reporter had this article. Sorry, it seems to be fake. <laughs> I didn't know that. So this happens all the time with white-listed news organizations as well. So again, our point here is that we don't say these news organizations are trustworthy. We say, believe yourself, these are the tools, these are the skills you can use, so you can analyze every single piece of information in every single news article, and then you can decide right, which part of the article is trustworthy, which part is opinion, which part is, part is speculation, which part is assumption, and whatnot. So, uh, the same uh, researchers from Yale University, they also had that article. It says, I'm using this because you know, it confirms my belief. <laughs> so they say analytic thinking is the key, not fact checking. Analytic thinking is the determining factor whether people can tell what is fake or what is not. Right? Uh, TES, as you know, TES publishes that university ranking Times University ranking, everybody cares about, that's the publisher. They also say the same thing, critical thinking, critical literacy is missing from many curriculums. So some of us in this field are sort of recognizing what is missing and how we reach here. And then we kind of blame the educational system, uh, saying that we should have taught critical thinking when kids are much younger, right? Um, so that's... Uh, and now United Nations on board. Anne Kruger uh, last week talked about how UNESCO is involved in media and information literacy education. Their Asia office in Thailand approached to us and we might be working together uh, with them next year. But UN itself in New York, they're also talking about how to include critical thinking skills, right? Uh, in their effort, I guess. <laughs> All right. And we still have 20 minutes, and I will show some of the content from the online course I produced. Uh, it's called Making Sense of the News, News Literacy Lessons for Digital Citizens. This is a six-week course, and it's a diluted version of what we teach on campus. Uh, ours are targeting university students. It's a 14-week course, a uh, 13-week course. This one is a shortened version, six weeks. Um, and it's free, so if you're interested, you can take that. Um, I work with many other uh, colleagues from Hong Kong U, of course, and also Stony Brook University. They have the Center for News Literacy there, and I'm also an affiliate professor there. So I've been working with them closely for the last five, six years. Right? So our curriculum essentially covers, these are the key concepts, and again, we don't have time to go through everything, but we touch upon what journalism is in the first place, and we call it journalism should be uh, going through you know, verification process, V, I, meaning independent. The reporter or journalist has to be independent. Um, and A is accountable, they have to be responsible. So there are lots of concepts that we teach in our curriculum. Um, today, for the next 20 minutes, I want to focus on two things. Source analysis, a nice source analysis, and also how we deal with uh, evidence in news stories. And probably, I'm gonna just explain the source analysis and we can actually do a little exercise for the evidence part, and I think we have time. So for the source analysis, we tell the students, 
you know, ask these questions whenever you see a person in the news report. So if you have a news report with uh, seven paragraphs, probably second paragraph is quoting somebody, your professor from Hong Kong U. Fourth paragraph is quoting somebody from the government. Right? Seventh paragraph, quote somebody, report an interview in the street. Right? So we underline every person who appears in those stories and, and ask students, OK, who is this person? Right? What's the name? What's the position? What's the expertise? Why is this person commenting on this particular news event? Right? Um, why did journalists choose this person? Is he because is he an expert, or is he was he available at the time <laughs> and nobody else, right? So we sort of think about why is this person quoted in the first place, and then the next question is: Is this person giving opinion or is this person giving evidence? What sort of information is this person giving to the journalist, right? So if it's an opinion, then we should take it as an opinion, not fact, right? If there's a nuclear accident in Fukushima in Japan and you interview a nuclear expert in Hong Kong New, probably what you can get is an opinion. As a nuclear expert, I think this is what happened in Fukushima, because this person wasn't there. This person wasn't consulted by Japanese government. So he's an expert. He is knowledgeable. He tells something probably useful for the audience. But that's, again, it's his opinion as an expert. It's different from somebody who's working in Fukushima giving information to the journalist. right? So we look at each piece of information and relate that to the person who's giving that information to the reporter. So we go through all this. And then to make it you know, easier and sticks to her memory, what we do is this. Every time you encounter a person in the news story, it could, have, it could be a TV video, uh, we say, is this person a nice source? A stands for, is this person authoritative or informed? Do we know the name of that person? Oftentimes, uh, especially in Asia, news reports are full of anonymous sources. We don't really know who they are. Um, so if it's anonymous, then obviously it's impossible for other people to double check if that's what really that person said, right? So independent sources are better. Uh, sources whose information is corroborated. In other words, if there's another evidence, independent evidence included in the story that confirms the particular information that's better than single source story. Uh, so we use this sort of analysis as a tool to sort of look at news stories. And then we create a chart like this, and you know, students do exercise. So we have a story, so it's one, two, three, four, five, and you have to analyze. You know, this is authoritative, uh, maybe three, you know? Is, do we know his name? Yes, of course, five. So they sort of, you know, within a spectrum, they think about each source and then decide which story, well, which piece of information is more credible than the others. It's a really time consuming process, <laughs> yes. But I think it's a training, and that's what we are trying to do. It takes a long time for students to consume one single story with this, uh, uh, tool, but you know, once you start doing it, our belief is that it becomes natural and habitual. So you don't have to make this chart anymore. You just read it and you naturally do it in your brain. So that's what we believe. All right, perfect. So next, evidence, and that's another key concept that we teach in our curriculum, and this is what I want to do with you. So if you could take out a piece of paper, if you don't have a notebook, maybe you can ask yeah, yeah, some are sitting next to you. Hey, do you have a piece of paper? <laughs> so basically, what I would like you to do is to write this spectrum. On the left side is the direct evidence. On the right side is the indirect evidence. And left requires less corroboration. In other words, it's a solid evidence that you can kind of believe, you know. And on the right side is not so trustworthy evidence. In other words, yes, it's there in the story, but I don't know how to make of it, what to make of it. Um, so direct evidence and indirect evidence. And I have, I rem if I remember correctly, I have seven pieces of information, right? So I'm going to show you seven different information in a story about a police officer shooting somebody in the street of, in Mongkok. 
right? Um, so you have to say, let's say, for example, evidence number one, I'm going to show you that piece of information. And if you think it's a solid evidence, you put here number one. And if you think the second information is not so trustworthy, <coughs> maybe you put it somewhere like this, number two. And here's number three, number four. So you get the idea. So basically, you just write down numbers you know, after judging the credibility of that particular evidence. So the story is police officer shooting someone in the street, right? The first information you have is photos and videos taken by onlookers, right? passers-by. In other words, they saw a police officer shooting, so they took the photos, videos, put it on YouTube, uh, photos on Instagram, so it's everywhere on social media. Twitter's full of pictures, YouTube has full of videos, so many, many, many people took the videos and photos and uploaded it. And you have that, right? So evidence number two. Now, there's this clerk who's working for the police department. <laughs> she heard a rumor saying that the police officer in question who shot the gun, he was actually suffering from mental disorder. He shouldn't be on duty, right? Because he was depressed. So that's a rumor, right? And reporters quoting office rumor, hard by a clock. So evidence number three, the reporter also interviewed and quoted criminology expert from Chinese University of Hong Kong. So this criminology expert officer says, well, you know, in our system, we don't actually screen police officers for their mental health. So it's quite possible that somebody who's suffering from depression can be patrolling our street. So that's what the expert from Chinese U said. So that's number three. Number four, somehow reporter got hold of the medical record of that particular officer in question. And according to that, yes, at least until two years ago, I mean, let's say two months ago, let's say, until two months ago, he was suffering from some sort of mental disorder. So that's what the medical record shows right? up until two months ago. And number five. Now, the reporter also interviewed a doctor who treated that officer. And the doctor said, well, yes, I was treating him, and he is completely cured. Right? So he should be you know, perfectly capable of fulfilling his duty as a patrolling police officer. His mental condition shouldn't be an issue we should be discussing, because you know, he's perfectly fine now. That's what the doctor said. Now, police is investigating the shooting. And I don't know if this really works or not. But let's say they did a blood test, right? It's not a conclusive result, but according to the interim results from the blood test, it seems the officer was actually under some sort of uh, medication that suppresses the depression. In other words, the doctor said he's fine now, but it seems he was taking some sort of medicine, right, um, to relieve his anxiety or something. Right? So that's the interim report says. And the last piece of the puzzle that you see on the news article is police officer's Facebook post. <laughs> of course, right? So police officer, <laughs> Before he goes on to patrol, he updated his status on Facebook and said, well, it's a great day. I'm going to the, you know, uh, <laughs> um, going to Mong Kok, you know, uh, it's going to be another fine day or something, <laughs> right? So basically, just a normal post, nothing that indicates that he's going to shoot another person in <laughs> two hours later, right? So you have seven pieces of evidence and you now put it on your chart, right? Okay. So now it's time for you to compare your chart with the person sitting next to you and see how they are different or similar. And for that, I, well, you have time. I'll give you two, three minutes. Compare the chart and discuss what you think about is the most reliable information and what is not. <laughs>
Yes. What's the thesis, which is a big R or a or right? So number one is an evidence. Yeah. Well, if he was mentally uh, not stable, I guess he shouldn't be patrolling our street, right? So, no, okay, no. So each one is different. So when you have a news story, the video can be used for as an evidence that it really happened, right? But uh, second story and. Uh, Second and uh, probably sixth and fifth, they are conflicting information. Right. So we wanna uh, we wanna know if the police officer was suffering from some mental disorder or not. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 Okay. All right. Yes. Yes. Huh? Yeah. Oh, no, it's just a direct and indirect. Yeah. So it, it comes with a range, yes. Yeah. Well, quality of the information, right? If the high quality meaning yeah. you can trust it. Yeah. 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 Yes, that, that's not, yeah. Yeah, we don't consider that. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, all right. All right, uh, again, <laughs> I have to stop uh, now. So, uh, there was an interesting question about the legitimacy of getting such information as a reporter, and actually that's what we address in our class as well. The medical, past medical record, that should be, uh, you know, uh, yeah, uh, in our video, if you actually watch the instructional video we created for the online course, we mentioned that. We say it's, you know, yeah, e ethically, it's probably not a good idea <laughs> to use that kind of information for a news story, but let's suppose this is just a thought, you know, exercise. But anyway, um, so basically, you know, uh, people have put one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in a different chat. No, no, this is just one, one, one person did it. And then yours could be completely different, right? So the point, I don't know, I put it in the middle, but you might disagree with me. But the point I want to make here is that evidence in journalism is not all solid. So again, if you have seven paragraphs, there's a credible information and not so credible information, right? And what you get from news stories oftentimes is a likely scenario or likely scenarios. It happened in this way, it happened in that way. We don't really know yet, but we are still working on this story, and this is as much as we know. Uh, another important uh, concept we discuss in our curriculum is provisional truth. When journalists say we tell the truth, they don't mean absolute philosophical truth. They just mean that this is the truth based on what we have right now. Right? This could change tomorrow if we have new evidence. So we sort of talk about how the meaning of truth in journalism is different from what we, when we use the word truth in a general sense. Right? So audience needs to evaluate the facts in the news. 
And basically, we analyzed real news articles. The shooting was not really, you know, I prepared Whitney Houston because I was sort of expecting older generation today <laughs> in the audience. My students don't know who Whitney Houston is. This doesn't work with <laughs> my university students. But basically, so, you know, Headline often concludes likely scenario. In other words, according to the evidence, reporter has this might have happened. And then story sort of explains each evidence and quotes and opinions. But that doesn't mean it's the whole truth, right? So evidence has to be evaluated by report uh, audience as well. So that's just one uh, illustration of these concepts that we included in our curriculum. So if you're interested, uh, either take our online course or, you know, uh, um, come to Hong Kong U maybe. <laughs> yeah. And we do uh, workshops once in a while for uh, other educators as well. Basically, we're always looking for somebody who's teaching media literacy, critical thinking, uh, or journalism to work with us so that we can sort of, you know, modify our curriculum and also their curriculum together. All right, so that's pretty much for today, thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Yes. So, yeah, I think uh, I have minutes. So, if you have any questions, yes. Yes. So in a way, when journalism treat other people that like not so smart, they think critical, critical, critical thinking. It just like if we are in a higher level of dumb people, who they think they are dumb. And I guess the, this kind of opinion may not be right for journalists. Uh, well, that's what we believe. Basically, we well, if you look at the history of journalism, fake news has always been around with us forever. So it's not a new phenomenon that way, but social media definitely made it easier for people who produce made up information to distribute that content and also make money out of that. So in that sense, it's accelerating compared with before. But our belief is that, no, we, it's, a wrong, it's wrong to try to stop fake news spreading because it's impossible. What we are trying to do is to immunize the audience side. So when we see fake news, we can sort of see it. We can recognize it. So our resistance the, from the audience towards fake news is much higher. So but that's the, yes? But I guess for the audience or the readers, yep. they don't care if it's fake news. They just say, OK, after I read it, I just feel it is right. Yeah. Then that, that matters. Because for true or false, it doesn't matter to the audience. Yes. Just, uh, that's <coughs> true for the older generation. That's why we want to bring our curriculum to the younger generation. Uh, we talked about cognitive dissonance. We spent, I spent at least 10 minutes talking about how brain functions when they, we process information. That gets solidified as you get older. So it's much easier to teach critical thinking skills to age between 13 to 17 than 25 years old, 30 years old, because their belief is already there. right? So yes, I agree with you. Uh, we think that. We have to teach these kind of things when people are a bit younger, right? Yes? But sometimes it's not fake or not. Right. Sometimes you try to get comments, fire yeah. comments all right. the time. Right. You know, the influence right. effect. Right. And that's why I said uh, especially certain topics in certain culture and countries are tricky. So in Asia in particular, uh, fake news is a huge social problem in Indonesia, the Philippines, India. Bangladesh and Myanmar. And oftentimes, fake news appeal to the emotion, right? There's racism going on. There's uh, ideas against certain religious minorities. And fake, uh, fake stories feed on those emotional reactions. And people comment a lot. And they, you don't know what is opinion and what is truth, right? So for example, if you say, well, we shouldn't call them Rohingyas. They are Bengali illegal immigrants. If somebody says that, it's an it's a, it's a, you know uh, outrageous opinion in, if if you ask me. But some people think, oh, that's true. They are illegal immigrants, right? So they might see it as facts, and it appeals to their beliefs. So that that's a 
uh, you are right. You know, it's a big problem on social media because anybody can comment, and those comments are mixed with facts. And in Myanmar, there's a counter uh, movement. Uh, whenever you see hate speech or negative comment towards a certain minority group of people, uh, other people will rush there and then try to post positive comment one after another. <laughs> and sometimes it works, other times it doesn't work, but there are counter you know, uh, effort happening yeah, in some countries. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? So when I think about fake news, I think about things like Pizzagate. Okay, US right, videos. right. I'm curious, do you think, are there similar things like that happening in, in Hong Kong media? Um, I, just, I know more about the US media. So right. I'm curious, is there a lot of that kind of fake news production going on here in Hong Kong? Uh, yes, uh, we saw lots of fake news stories, especially during the umbrella uh, movement. Yeah, uh, on both sides. So there was a story about uh, this woman losing her baby because she was supposed to be taken to a hospital in ambulance, but students were blocking the street and she couldn't reach the hospital in time. And that story was everywhere. Even our chief executive uh, included that story in his public statement saying that students, you should stop. And it was not true. <laughs> And so you like, know, so yeah. Was it like deliberately fabricated, or was it so that part like is journalism yeah. or like deceitful? It, it was so. Um, again, I think in that case we don't know who created this, but um, there are some people who are trying to intentionally manipulate the public opinions by creating that kind of stories. So it's intentional, in my opinion. There are lots of photoshopped images circulating in Hong Kong, and those are clearly intended manipulation going on, right? So again, it, it's on both sides. So the student protesters photoshopped people holding umbrellas all yellow. So, so you see a street of people all you know, holding yellow umbrella to say that public opinion is supporting the students. You know, government is against public's will. That's not true. They just painted yellow those umbrellas in Photoshop. And the Chinese side, uh, in China, they had a photo of students gathering in Tamao site, and they added Chinese na flags in those <laughs> students and said, students are celebrating China's National Day because it was close to October 1st when the students started boycotting. So on both sides, they're intentionally manipulating, and we have been seeing that for the last four or five years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. right. Like right. Yeah. One-sided Right, right. So yeah, it's it's it's. I guess in Asia, it's nothing new. The big news. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> right, um, and the issue in Asia is that in, so in 2014, when we had this problem, we could see it because it was on internet forum, golden forum, and also on the Facebook, many pages uh, public. Now, misinformation spreads through WhatsApp messaging app, and outsiders cannot see it. So if you are in a group of, like, say, 3,000 people who are all supporting uh, the establishment who are all supporting the student movement, you exchange information within that circle. And outsiders, journalists, cannot really see what sort of misinformation people are actually circulating and believing. So chat app is something that we are, uh, how do you say, uh, monitoring at the moment and see what we can do about it. It's much harder. On Facebook, you can at least flag the information. But in WhatsApp messages, it's almost impossible. And it's encrypted. Um, so it's, it's really hard, yeah, yeah. Okay. Any other? It's almost time, right? All right, thank you very much again. Yeah.